half in the bag. Uh, so Jay, what else did you see? I'm thinking of ending things. What? We just started this VCR repair shop business 14 years ago. How could you? How am I ever gonna find another person equally qualified to fix and or repair VCRs as good as you, Jay? I better start going to monster.com to look for applicants. VCR repair, I guess I should write person and not be sexist, person. Zero results. Hmm, I guess I'll go to LinkedIn. LinkedIn, VCR repair person. Zero results. Oh no, Mike, I was talking about the motion picture. I'm thinking of ending things. Oh, right. Also, I want to kill myself. <laughs> I've never experienced anything like it. I'm thinking of ending things. Huh? What? Did you say something? I don't think so. Well, I saw him thinking of ending things, too. We both saw this film. It was a Netflix film. Should have been on the big screen. <laughs> No, it's four, or to see that, that four, four by three four glorious. By three glory, yeah. <laughs> it's just like seeing a Christopher Nolan film. I like that four by three has come back for certain movies. There's some films where it really works, where it feels like claustrophobic and, and appropriate. A ghost story. And this is a ghost story was another one. And this is one where I think it definitely benefits from from that look. Uh, I liked this movie a lot. I did too. Um, I, it needs a second, third, and a fourth rewatch, but I really liked it. It's it's a little frustrating. I, I think you had said at one point that Charlie Kaufman's a little too smart for his he's, own good. He's too smart for his audience. Yeah. Well, I, for his own good. I mean, this is a movie that almost demands uh, homework from you after you watch it. You got to do some reading up because it's tons and tons of literary references and theater references and movie references that aren't making you aware that they're references. You right. either know what they're talking about or you don't. Yeah. And you either understand why they're talking about it or you don't. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot to process. Mm. Um, but just as like a surreal story about a man's relationship falling apart, uh, you know, it works that way. Even though that's not really what it's about right, when you get to yeah. the end. But while you're watching it, uh, the, the tension of, of them being in the house with the parents, like, you understand the emotions of it, even if you don't understand logistically what's happening. Yeah, I mean, it's the trailer, of course, is misleading because most people won't like this movie. Yes. I, I, I'm sure, I haven't looked it up, but I'm sure it has a, you know, uh, tons of zero stars. It's one of those, suck, yeah, zero suck. stars or ten stars, zero, probably. Yeah. Yeah. It was brilliant, it was brilliant. It was, this is the worst thing I've ever seen because it has it has that sheen of a, a semi-narrative going over it. Mm -hmm. And it has an unreliable narrator issue. Yes. Um, which, you know, throws you off balance because it's... it's, it's It's a movie about an old janitor. Um, and it's... Who's so pathetic that when he fantasizes about his ideal life, the girl in that fantasy still wants to leave him. Right, right. <laughs> and, Spoilers! Uh, yes, she, it's, you get inside her head. You hear her thoughts. Yes. And you're like, okay, here's our narrator. Here's our protagonist. And she doesn't exist. <laughs> and, um, and so it's fucked up. And yet she has more character and humanity than he does. Yeah. He's very he, misanthropic, which is pretty typical for Charlie Kaufman. Yes. He, he's, he's pathetic. I can't remember what he looks like. Why would I? He was just, just one of thousands of such non-interactions in my life. I don't know, how, how do you talk about this movie without <laughs> encapsulating the whole thing? Yeah. Well, I think explaining what it's about is doing quite a bit, because I'm sure there's a lot of people that get to the end and they're just frustrated and angry. Yeah, right, right. But that's where the, the references come in, because he's someone who's just filled his empty life with media, with movies, with right. books. With, so there's one part in the car when he's getting into an argument with her. They're talking about... What's the movie? It's a John Cassavetes movie. But she just starts quoting the Pauline Kael review. Yeah, well, there's a Pauline Kael book. On yeah, the shelf. you see that later. Yeah. And so, it, yeah, but if you're watching this and she just starts going into this voice, and you're like, what? So it's, like I said, it requires homework, right. which can be frustrating. Uh, but I, I think enough, at least for me, enough of the movie worked even before kind of digging into the things that I didn't quite connect with. I, I think it still works. It's just a, a solid kind of moody 
creepy movie. Oh, sure. It's interesting to watch. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, your audience is going to want to grasp onto a narrative. And, and, like, and then when you get to the house and uh, Tony Collette's there and she's crazy. And Tony Collette's become, kind of reminding me of Judy Greer, where it's like, it seems like she's just in everything. Yeah, <laughs> and, and then all these just weird, like, bizarre things start happening. There's, there's time skips. And time sk- yeah, and... Uh, I thought the whole movie was going to be in that house once they got there. Mm. That was the impression I got, that we were just going to kind of see the passing of time and, right. all, the, and all these, like, uh, you know, time glitches while they were in this house. So then, like, halfway through, they leave the house. I was like, oh, now I have no idea where we're going. It feels like a fever dream. It's claustrophobic. It's, it's, it's strange. Uh, it's, it's Almost impenetrable. Almost impenetrable, <laughs> yes. It's, it's not accessible to a regular audience. You have to really think, and then watching it again and again probably would help out a lot. And the problem with that is that it's such a depressing movie, you're not going to want to rewatch it anytime soon. Right, right. But just to pick up on clues, and, and then it's a fun character study that, that almost you don't see the character mm-hmm. that it's about. You see him in, in a way that he's imagining everything. It's just, it's, yeah, it's good. Which girl? There were several. Several? Or three. Several is anything more than two. Really? Mm-hmm. Look it up. Look it up? Can you stop saying that? That guy, that actor in this, uh, what is his name? Jesse Plemons? Jesse Plemons. He was on Breaking Bad. He, I don't know if this is true, but is it, was, his, was he his backup for Philip Seymour Hoffman, who's dead? Oh, Cause, cause this is a Philip Seymour Hoffman role, yeah. I mean, Philip Seymour Hoffman was in Schenectady, New York. Schenectady, and, yeah. And that's a Charlie Kaufman movie. And, and it just, I know Philip Seymour Hoffman is dead, so obviously he could not play this part, but that Jesse Plemons guy, you he's know. Like he's kind of doing. He, he's kind of, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman probably would have been a little too old for the role, unless you up the age of the, the girl. But um, it just kind of feels like that's the kind of guy he wants like yeah. you know it's like the Woody Allen stand-in in Woody Allen movies like oh, yeah. a, Jesse Fleeman's kind of reminds me of like I want Philip Seymour Hoffman yeah oh, he's dead. I can see that yeah, I want him someone who's like him kind of kind <laughs> of mumbles a little <laughs> and just... but yeah good movie uh, hard to recommend because it's gonna often be off-putting to a lot of people but it, it, again uh, with your point of uh, how how many milliseconds would this movie have died in a movie theater? <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 they would have hit play on the movie and the, the theater would have collapsed in like the, the poltergeist house. <laughs> <laughs> that theater no longer exists. We played the new Charlie Kaufman movie. <laughs> So I talked about Uncle Frank from, uh, written and directed by Alan Ball, who's done other stuff, and this sort of feels like a little watered down version of his, his usual material. Uh, I watched On the Rocks. Did you watch On the Rocks? I did not. Bill Murray and uh, Ann Perkins. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Rashida, Rashida Jones. Jones. I was mildly curious about it for about five seconds, and then I forgot completely about it. Oh my gosh, do you look beautiful. You live. How's your mom's hip? Good, thanks. Good. He thinks you're my girlfriend. Grace. Um, but yeah, On the Rocks, Bill Murray. Directed uh, by Sofia, Sofia Coppola. Coppola. And then, uh, of course, Bill Murray was in Lost in Translation, Sofia Coppola's big breakout hit. The only movie of hers that I like. Yes. <laughs> Which and, is why I was um, curious about this one, because uh, of Bill Murray. And then you want to talk about watering down On the Rocks. It happened. Mm. It is, it is, uh, it is white toast. Uh, so the premise of the movie is uh, Rashida Jones is married to Marlon Wayans, but he's off doing some kind of like tech work. He's a computer 
and uh, the Silicon Valley guy, and they're doing a startup, and you know, ah, kind of thing. And he's always flying around on business trips, and there's this lady that is always around him, and he's like, oh, it's you know, it's what's her face? She's you know, we're, we're buddies, you know. And then they find out like, oh, she she found some of her shit in his in his luggage, so she starts to suspect an affair, hmm. and um, she, uh, you know, she's. Uh, getting kind of clues about that and so then Bill Murray shows up who's her father and he's an old time old time playboy womanizer kind of character who divorced the mother and he kind of says like sleazy advice he's hitting on waitresses he then um, kind of weasels his way into her life and says I'm going to help you find out if this guy's cheating she shows up in his little sports car and they go driving around and they follow him and um, I thought that it was gonna be like them bonding. That's what I assume. It was like a yeah, father daughter reconnecting it, type. It happens thing. a little bit, and then. Uh, she kind of finds out that he wasn't cheating, and then it ends. <laughs> <laughs> oh. The guy she thought her husband was gonna be the sleazy guy, but it turns out he's just completely faithful. And sort of like a changing of the guard, the old ways of the old, old crusty white guys who sleep around. And my dad was a womanizer, so maybe my husband's a womanizer, but yeah, my um, husband's not a womanizer, so there's no drama or tension. Yes. <laughs> Sounds great. I think Rich said this talking about The Last Jedi, where he's like, I like, I like twists in movies that make the story less interesting. <laughs> and it's weird that Bill Murray would be playing that, like he used to be like a womanizer, because that was this character in Broken Flowers. Mm-hmm. Much better film. But that's, and there's kind of that part of the humor is the contrast of he's pathetic, sad-looking Bill Murray, but everyone talks about him like he used to be this playboy. And there's yeah. that incongruity, which is where the humor comes from. But in this, it sounds like it's just, he just straight up was a womanizer, and well, it's weird it, for Bill Murray. It's not like overt, like, he's not like a sleazy womanizer. Okay. He's, he's very rich, um, like he has a driver, and he has sports cars, and it, I, I don't know if it says like, uh, and, and there's no like remorse or regret, he just is who he is, and then he's just wrong about suspecting the husband being being a cheater. I mean, that's that's kind of all of her things. They're, they're no real drama, just kind of loosey-goosey, flailing around, not much happens. It works in Lost in Translation because those characters are so strong yeah. and their, their kind of connection is strong. But that's why I don't like any of her other movies because it's just like a whole lot of nothing and not a lot to latch on to. What other Sofia Coppola movies have I seen? I don't know. Which ones you've seen? Did she, she, she did do, Diversion Suicide. She did 28 Days Later? <laughs> she did 28 Weeks Later. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she did 300 and Batman vs. Superman. Re Resident Evil? She did Resident Evil. Uh, Resident uh, Evil Apocalypse? Not Apocalypse. She did Resident Evil Afterlife. Okay, okay. Thank you. I'm going to take that as a compliment. <laughs> Are there two? Speaking of things that happened and are bland, I saw... The New Mutants. It happens. But this, it's hard to believe this was a, meant to be a theatrical film because it really feels like the first episode of a TV show because mm. nothing happens. And you're like, oh, we're just setting up all of our characters for future episodes, but it's just a movie. And they realize nothing happens because then you get to the end and they just fight a giant monster. <laughs> We've had him sit around this, this, this mental hospital or whatever it's supposed to be, this research hospital for the entire movie doing nothing. I guess they fight a monster at the end. Welcome to comic book movies, Jay. I, I suppose. No, this is like bottom of the barrel as far as story goes for, for a comic book movie. Yeah. I know you have to have something big happen at the end of your comic book movie, but you usually have good character stuff throughout leading up to it. Yeah. No. It, it takes place in this hospital. They're the only like patients in the hospital it's like whatever five of them six of them and there's one employee she's the only one in the hospital there's nobody in this fucking movie it's so weird hmm. well, i know they set up in the trailer that on anna taylor joy she's like i killed 19 men yeah uh, does she turn out to be like a bad guy at the no. end no she just does a bad Russian accent. There's so many bad accents in this movie, too. I think she's a really good actress. I think she's really interesting. I'll talk about her in The Queen's Gambit in a minute. But 
bad accent in this movie. The Stranger Things kid is doing like a southern accent. It sounds laughable. Everybody, it's like career worst performances from all these people. Mm. And they're just kind of sitting around. I'm surprised it wasn't directed by Sofia Coppola because nothing happens. Oh, does it just make an X Men live action TV show? Sure. Like, just fuck it. <laughs> Scrap everything and start from the beginning. Because you said it looks like a TV show. TV shows look as good as movies now. Yeah. Like, fuck it. TV shows look better than this movie. What, who, who owns X Men? Paramount or 20th Century Fox? No, now it's, it's Fox, which yeah. is Disney. But yeah, I mean, especially if the theater format is sort of going away. Well, yeah. I mean, a movie like this doesn't help. Like, this movie wasn't going to bring people back to the theaters. Bunch of fucking boring kids sitting around in a room for 90 minutes, and then they fight a bear. <laughs> wow, great film. A <laughs> uh, quick shout-out to a very, very, very short little TV series I watched, uh, which was on Showtime. I think I said Showtime was all trash. You did. It's not all trash. Uh, it's There's called a recorded record of you saying it. Uh, oh God! The worst I think is Showtime. The worst I think is Showtime. The worst I think is Showtime. Oh yeah, there is. Uh, it's called Moonbase Eight. I just got a lot on the line here. I mean, I screwed up my whole life. That's why I need to get to the moon. I go up to the moon. I'm a hero. <sighs> Tim Heidecker, Fred Armisen, and John C. Riley, and they're schlubs who uh, live in a moon base, not on the moon, in the desert in Arizona. It's a testing site for them eventually to go to the moon. See, I didn't even realize, I think I saw the trailer, I didn't realize they were just on Earth. Yeah, yeah. That makes the whole thing much funnier. It, it is. Because <laughs> um, it's just like all the things they encounter are things that would just never happen on the moon. Mm. I mean, there's a cattle drive <laughs> that, that has to come by. <laughs> Ran ranchers tell them to like um, they got to move their base because their cattle drives coming through so they figure out a way to use like little NASA rockets to like distract the cows from hitting their moon base <laughs> and then there's like a, like, a, like a homeless junker who keeps stealing their stuff um, <laughs> the problems they would incur would not happen on the moon it makes no sense okay it makes no sense but it's fun that's great and they're mostly ad-libbing I think Launch sequence beginning in nine, eight, nine, seven, eight, six, five, stand by, let's sync four. up. Four. Abort? It's, it's, oh, yeah. it's just very loose, and you know, Fred Armisen is being Fred Armisen, <laughs> saying weird things, and John C. Riley is like, he's like pathetic. <laughs> he's like, um, he's, uh, oh God, he, he ran a helicopter tourism. A company in in uh, Hawaii, and he went bankrupt. So this is like his way of like like showing his family that uh, he could do something, mm. go on the moon. <laughs> and uh, Tim Heidecker is like a religious Christian, mm. and he like skypes with his family, and he has like nineteen kids, <laughs> and his wife is like like sleeping with the pastor of their church. Clearly. Um, and then Fred Armisen is, uh, he's living in the shadow of his successful father, who was like a NASA scientist who worked on the Apollo missions. Uh, he's also smart. He's a doctor. Um, but he's, he's just doing this like, he's, he's working below his, his intelligence level. Mm -hmm. And so the three of them live and they have these little bunks that are like right next to each other with like these like, like, like closet doors. <laughs> it's, there's just like crappy sets. Um, <laughs> It's not like, it's, it's just so like loose and fun and it's not like overly like scripted mm. joke here, joke here, joke here. It's just sort of like, just seems like they're having fun. Does it have a, an ending? Is it, does it feel like a limited series or does it feel like the first season of a series? It feels like the, it ends on, I wouldn't call it a cliffhanger, but um, every, every time they, they get a communication from NASA, it's like, um, oh, it has those computer sound effects that we use. Like, oh. And the, so it's, it, it comes on a computer screen, and it's like the Siri voice. Today, your assignment will be. So it's questionable whether or not they're actually working for NASA or not. 
<laughs> at, at the end, they show them like uh, there's somebody watching them through like screens, mm. and then it cuts away. Okay. So they may not actually be working for NASA. Right. I don't so know. So there's a lead in too. It could be more. All right. Yeah, yeah it's fun. Goofy nonsense. Yeah, but it's not too goofy. It's like right on that borderline of, I mean, it crosses over the line, but it's like, is, should I, are, are they taking it seriously? Should okay. I take this at all seriously? It's not like, like crazy, uh, it's grounded sort of. Speaking of shorts, series you said your show is only six or eight episodes or whatever i watched the queen's gambit which did not seem like the kind of thing i would be interested in at all but people kept recommending it to me i don't give a shit about chess uh but it's very very good tell the readers of life how it feels and to be a girl among all those men i don't mind it chess isn't always competitive do you even know how to play chess i absolutely do not and watching this entire series i didn't figure it out it's not really about chess. It's like a sports movie. It's like Rocky isn't really about boxing. It's about Rocky. And this is like that, too. It's based on a book uh, It was apparently supposed to be adapted in, like, the early 2000s, directed by Heath Ledger. But then he passed away, and so that obviously didn't kind of fell apart. But uh, I, I think it works better as a limited-run series than it would have as a two-hour movie because it really gives you time to see your main character's backstory, see how she grew up, see how she became the person she became why she has substance abuse problems, which is what she's trying to overcome. But there weren't any like female chess players back then. It was no. just like, no. Um, and so uh, when I watched the trailer, I was like, because it wasn't really a trailer. It was like that a scene, you know, Netflix preloads a little thing. Yeah. And it was her like signing up, you know. Are you sure you want to do this? I'm sure. We don't have a women's section. I'll put you in beginners. I'm not a beginner. And so I was like, oh, this is cool. Is, is this really happened? Is, is, did some, some girl, like, weasel her way into the high ranks of the chess world in the 1960s and become famous? And uh, no. And so, like, because I like historical stuff. I like true stories. And, and I was like, oh, uh, so sort of fictionalized. No, no, it's, it's a it serious story, but it's, it's well done. It's, it's got lots of really, like, like, swooping shots. Like, there's lots of, because you're kind of like, She's an orphan. Her, her, her uh, mother died when she was really little, so she grew up in this orphanage. And so a lot of it is kind of told through her eyes of, like, discovering the world for the first time. And so you get, like, she goes to Vegas, and it's, like, like cool retro 1960s Vegas. And we get these sweeping shots of the, uh, the hotel as she goes into it. And we go up to the second floor. Uh, maybe I'll check it out. I, I, I think it's worth if it. If I run out of terrible shows to watch. It's, you know, it, it goes by pretty quick. It's, like, eight episodes and... It has that, that energy of a sports movie, but it's about yeah. uh, chess. Well, you gotta keep that camera moving. You gotta keep things exciting when you're dealing with chess. It's true, it's true. Because people are just sitting there. And her performance, too. She's, you know, so many like, younger actors, they all kind of blend together, but there's something about her that really, she's really distinct. She really stands out, and she's, this is probably her best performance. Well, let's talk about our feature event. This is the grand finale, everybody. The grand finale of all the garbage, <laughs> forgettable trash. One of the only fucking movies I was actually uh, excited to see. Possessor. Oh, me out. There were things I liked about Possessor, but overall, I did not like it. Oh. I found it uh, amateurish in nature. Really? In uh, uh, how old is Brandon Cronenberg? I don't know. This is his second movie. He did a movie before this called Antiviral. Is he like twenty or something? <laughs> I, mean, uh, I mean, he's older than that. I don't know. I don't know anything about him. I'm not a big David Cronenberg fan. I know you like this weird stuff. <laughs> I'm um, a big David Cronenberg fan. Yes. Uh, I, I like weird stuff too. This this is this is hard to explain because it's riding the line between uh, telling a narrative and bizarre fucked up mind stuff. It reminded me of of uh, The Exorcist Part Two. Oh my God, that's the most bizarre <laughs> thing. Um, that, in what way? That weird hospital where they're doing like a mental science fiction experiments on the possessed girl. Yeah, and I think it was the retro look of stuff too. Okay. There, there's. Stylistically, this is a neat movie, 
um, production production design wise. The the retro cars randomly um, the the 1970s like pro, uh, props the mm -hmm. the mask and the, the actual flipping of the switches and it felt it, the, it's it's a weird combination of future and and because he the character's jobs they're like data mining but it's not yes. like a computer program he's like physically looking into people's houses and, yeah. and like pointing out their drapes and right, stuff. It's right. really weird. It's like they need people to do that, which yeah. they probably don't. It, it had that kind of like, I don't know, uh, THX or Brazil or oh, uh, sure. this kind of weird, creepy, soulless like company that you're working for where you're just a cog in the machine. Um, and then, you know, outside of that, he lives in this really nice apartment with his girlfriend, who's the daughter of the guy. And then our main character, um, I, I don't know why I thought it was Tilda Swinton. You don't see her too much. Okay, so it has a premise that, that, that feels kind of like a Christopher Nolan movie, right? I, you know, I've watched it twice, and the second time I watched it, I was thinking of that. It's yeah. like, a, like a perverted version of a, that high-concept Christopher Nolan high, thing. High-concept, like heist, murder, yeah. kind of spy thing. Well, and definitely uh, Inception, the way you got to get, like, plugged in. Yes, and, yeah. Matrix, Inception, like mind-bending you're gonna see i love the concept i love the concept and i love the production design i thought it was a neat concept that so uh, what didn't you because i liked all those things too so i'm curious what you didn't like i i i didn't like i would have liked it if they had no plot <laughs> because <laughs> what? okay so the opening scene is uh a, a girl is sticking a thing in her head and then she s stabs a guy they set it up Right, perfectly, mm -hmm. and the job she stabs a guy, and then uh, not Tilda Swinton gets pulled out of it, and you're like, oh, okay, she was in her mind. She she possessed, she was possessed her. her. Yes, yeah. and it was this whole like like creepy evil company that that hires people. Um, the lady, we'll just call her Tilda Swinton. <laughs> she is very good at her job, which is she has a, like a well-trained mind where she can manage this. I guess it's very stressful on the brain. Mm -hmm. When you come out of it, you're disoriented and sick. And they do all these tests to make sure your, your mind is back in order. Right, um, and it can be a really traumatic and tough experience to possess another person, mm -hmm. which makes sense. And I, all that kind of science stuff in the beginning was great. And it's basically like an assassin. They do it for that reason. Yeah. I, I could think of many other reasons to do it <laughs> um, other than just murder for hire premises. It would be neat to possess like a fucking politician and go up to a podium and just say all sorts of crazy stuff <laughs> and throw off an election, yeah. you know, or... I mean, that might exist in this world. We maybe don't know. it does. That's, that's kind of what I like is the idea that you know there's a larger world, but we're just seeing this very specific story in it. Yeah, and the, 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 that's where the kind of the juvenile element comes from, is that it all just becomes stabbing and blood and killing. Uh, and then we're going to give spoilers here. So, Spoilers. Spoilers. Uh, the first job, nice and easy. The, the big fat guy at this event is a lawyer, they say. Mm -hmm. So clearly the, uh, uh, he's doing a big case and somebody else hired to kill the lawyer. Who knows? Um, but then the second job is she has to possess a man uh, who's, who's dating the daughter of essentially uh, Mark Zuckerberg, right? Or uh, Bezos, Jeff, Jeff Bezos, Bezos some, some big tech guy who owns this company that's essentially Facebook or Google or whatever. Right. So it's the, it's the brother uh, who wants the, the, the father dead and the daughter dead so that he can inherit the company and become wealthy and maintain control. Mm -hmm. And so he hires this company, the Possessor Company, to make it look like the boyfriend of the girl went crazy, murder, suicide. Boom, nice and easy. Yeah. Um, so that's the job. And I was like, oh, there's going to be some kind of twist because it's like a tech company, right? And they're data mining. So maybe at some point, the, the Sean Bean, the guy, knows that the guy is possessed. And then he does this and all these things. But it just kind of just becomes this like, like uh, pointless bloodbath. And then on top of that, I don't associate at all with our Tilda Swinton. Well, you're not supposed to. That's the story. The story isn't the assassination attempt. The story is the, the, the toll this job has taken on her and how at a certain point 
the the guy realizes what's happening and yeah. he pulls the thing out of his brain and they start to like uh, they're, they're, they cross the streams where they're going back and forth on yeah. who is who, what is what, and you realize that this whole time, like, she hasn't become desensitized to violence. She's become so uh, obsessed with the violence that she becomes desensitized to everything else, including her own family. I mean, that's the movie. You see, like, she has sex with her estranged husband early on, and all she can think about is stabbing that guy in the neck. So yeah. by the time you get to the end, when the guy is sort of re claimed his body right. and he's threatening her husband it starts to become a thing of like how much does she want him to kill the husband too because she doesn't give a fuck about these people anymore well then what it's about, it's about losing your sense of self i mean that's what the movie is more so than the assassination yeah i bet and i know the assassination isn't the plot yeah um and i know but but her character we have such little little to do with her in the beginning before she jumps in mm. and you know it's like oh is it is it just about money? Is it about her raking in just tons of money? Because they offer her shares in the company for this big job. And there's never like, I mean, this is, this is like base level stuff. Well, plotting right, sure. wise, where if this was just a Christopher Nolan movie, it would be, oh, oh honey, we can't pay the bills this month. Our, we're gonna house is in foreclosure. Uh, uh, little Johnny can't go to the school anymore. He's got to move from the private school to this terrible public school where he's going to get beat up again, right? I lost my job. Ah, <laughs> money problems. <laughs> you remember uh, five years ago when you used to do that thing where you put on the mask and you possessed people? <laughs> this, uh, this is baseline. Sure, sure. I, I, may, I, I need to reiterate that. Okay. Um, I don't want to do that again because when I do it, I go crazy and I lose all sense of myself and I've just spent the last five years in therapy getting over my blood lust, <laughs> right? I mean, what you're describing is probably the backstory to this. But story. I didn't get that. We're seeing after that. I just, okay I think that. she's despicable from the moment I see her because she's killing. I mean, maybe they could have done more of that. I think there's enough where it's like when she goes over to her, her estranged husband's house, she's outside and she's like rehearsing what to say. She's to losing sound her humanity. Like a, yeah, to sound yeah. like a normal person. My darling. My darling. My darling. Hi, darling. The little things like that. I think there's just enough. I don't like her either. I don't think that's the point. Yeah. Uh, you're not necessarily supposed to be on her side. Yeah. And you're then, just observing her story. Yeah. You could take it another route too, where you, the only time we see the guy pre-possession uh, is is when she's spying on them with like yeah. an audio listening that, device. That is something I think we needed to see more of him earlier yeah. on. Yeah. I mean, we're not supposed to be sympathetic towards him empathetic He's, you do once he once he realizes what's going on once he tries I mean, to like take control yeah. but it feels like when you get to that point you should have had more with him up front you, you, to, you certainly to connect with him a bit more even if you never met the person if the story is someone has possessed this person and made him murder his fiance and and his father-in-law in the bloodbath mm -hmm. of course you're going to feel sorry for them it's not their fault right and i don't want movies that are just boilerplate you know this is your hero you know like they work for certain things but you know i don't mind a creepy weird fucked up movie i just need to know some more information and it just seemed like he was reveling in the the joy of blood and guts and murder well that that's yeah that's one thing i did want to, i like the movie a lot um did you watch the uncut version do you know you didn't okay so you actually saw the the less violent version because that, that would be one of my complaints about it is it feels like and you you want to show when it's a movie about how this character is is kind of become uh, accustomed to violence where it doesn't affect her anymore you know you want to show that violence pretty matter of factly but there are moments where and this is weird coming from me but it's like too violent uh, there's a part, I think it's Sean Bean, she like, there's like an extreme close-up, and this is only in the uncut version, where she like scoops out his eyeball, and it's like, it's like extreme close-up, it's like a Lucio Fulci, like, schlock horror film. <laughs> where it goes past, you want to see it matter-of-factly, and I think they do that really well for a lot of it, but then when you cut to these extreme close-ups, it just feels like gratuitous, and it like cheapens it. Where it's like, look at this, look at this gore! It's not showing it just as like a violent act anymore. It's like right. reveling in it right. in a way that 
is counterintuitive to what the movie's trying to do. Yeah. So there's moments like that, the, the, the extreme gore in the uncut version. And I never want to say, like, watch the cut version. Like, you should watch the version that the filmmakers intended, I think. But I, I think the cut version worked a little bit better because it cut back on some of that stuff a bit. Yeah. The only thing I remember seeing that made me laugh was he hits the Michael, the husband, and he hits him with the meat cleaver, and it's like fingers fly off. Oh, yeah. It's like a rubber hand. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, you know, and but then, that's another one where then it cuts to an extreme close-up of the fingers and they're still moving yeah, slightly. It's like, show it blunt, matter of fact. I was thinking of Taxi Driver a bit, like the end of that movie where he's just shooting like the guy, because that happens at the beginning of this movie, the girl gets shot in the cheek and like blood squirts oh, out of right, her cheek. Right, right. Which, something really similar to that happens in Taxi Driver. But Taxi Driver is a movie that just shows shows the gore as it would happen. Right. It doesn't like celebrate it and it doesn't like cut to extreme close ups right. to, That's more to for, emphasize it. For Jason. That's movies. more yeah, it's like cheap horror movie stuff, which has its place, but yeah. it felt out of place in this movie. Ready? I I just never I, I would have loved more inner conflict with with her character, I just, I just, I just searched for that. Yeah. Like, can, can we have? Can she have a moment of like hesitation? And I think, too, he was like a loser, um, and and he had like a low. He he was dating out of his league, right? This sure. girl is wealthy, her father's wealthy, and he clearly doesn't have any skills. He's he's hired by the father as like a. Like a um, like a charity job right. and doing low level work, and so clearly he feels like um, he doesn't have any control. Mm -hmm. She has all the control, um, and so those two kind of character philosophies could butt at some point where he ch tries to break free, and then she could be a character who's. Yeah, spiraling downward. Like, let me go in again. I can do another job. Yeah. That's, that's all these things you're explaining. They're there. They're just. It feels like it starts 30 minutes into the movie mm -hmm. where I needed more backstory between her, even if it's, even if it's Hollywood backstory crap. <laughs> like I said, oh, I can't pay the bills. <laughs> what are we going to do? Become a possessor again. <laughs> I can't go back in, Michael. I can't. I, for me, I like the fact that this is just sort of a smaller glimpse at a larger kind of world. And all the backstory stuff you're talking about, you wish it was in there. To me, I can, it, it's, it's implied enough where I, I think you get enough in the movie to, to work with. I, I think that's, I think that's what, what really gets me with it, is that I wanted more from it. Mm. It, it, it was capable of much more. Uh, it had so many great... Um, uh, uh, ideas and starting points and and potential uh, that that whole the whole concept of of the the technology involved and the process yeah. well and, and the visuals of like when they show the the kind of splintering mind stuff how yeah, we're seeing that it, stuff was neat we're seeing it kind of literally where you see it like bounce back and forth between her and him yeah and, the melting faces the double yeah. the doubling of the vocal yeah, yeah voices his voice and hers at the same time like like creepy stuff like that worked and like when they when they kidnap the guy they have to kidnap him physically in order to put the thing in knock him out mm -hmm. and so he doesn't remember anything like you don't see them kidnapping him it's just like he's in a van and yeah. you, you know what happened and and they did it they're just so good at at their job yeah. you got him yeah we got him we have oh, done this a million times yes yeah. they, we're, we're really good at this but uh i just i i wanted it it had the the bedrock of having a great great uh character um conflicts if he had if he had broken out of the possessor taken control of the situation that's what he does but uh, but he just dies <laughs> like i mean i mean unraveled the whole conspiracy about it okay opened up the world of the movie a little more opened up the world uh, of the movie a little more prove he's not a murderer um, I know that's a whole other movie in itself. That's, that and is, by that yeah. time, it's too late to do all that. But I found myself thinking the movie was lacking. But Chick Fight. <laughs> now that's a movie. <laughs> Hey, 
Hey, why is there a gun on the tape?